All right. Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar today, AI for Product Managers. Uh, this is a particularly exciting session for me. Um, for those that have not met me before, I'm one of the co-founders uh, and the CEO of Edify Academy, um, which we've been in the market now for about eight months, running all types of AI upskilling programs. I'm particularly excited today to be uh, launching a couple of new co programs specifically geared towards product managers. And the reason this is such an exciting topic for me, uh, of course, for those who know me, I can see some of my previous students in the room at the moment. Uh, I do, of course, have a product background. Uh, and AI, I think, is fundamentally shifting uh, the way in which product teams need to operate. Uh, and today we're going to be looking more specifically at integrating AI uh, into the tech stack, but more from a strategic standpoint. And I'm joined by a very, very exciting guest speaker. I'll let her introduce herself in just a minute. Um, I'm, I guess I'm not going to give anything away. Um, who's going to share some of her uh, some of her learnings along the way uh, and part of what she's kind of experienced within her own uh, company called Hatch Labs. We asked a very quick check-in question there at the start, and thank you to everyone who, who participated in that. We do have a very busy session today, but we wanted to ask you, what are some of the challenges you're currently facing when it comes to implementing AI tools into your products? Uh, we can see strategy coming through there um, as, as one of the sort of consistent themes. Uh, so really kind of having a strategy in place, ensuring that AI is kind of on the product roadmap. Uh, upskilling, of course, very topical to today's webinar um, for those who are attending. Uh, obviously a great step in trying to learn a little bit more about some of the things you should think about when it comes to the integration of AI. Uh, data, uh, I mean, data is, uh, I think for the last 15 years, been the sort of make or break uh, for any kind of digital transformation. Uh, and of course, in, a, in an AI powered world, uh, data can either be your strategic moat or it can kind of cripple you, uh, as well as some other things coming through there as well. So cybersecurity, privacy concerns, technical limitations, team compliance, uh, prompting, understanding, uh, et cetera. We can see the responses as they keep coming through. Before we jump into today's session, I always just like to start with this quote. Um, and I think it's really uh, important to note, particularly if you're working in product right now or you're leading a product team, there might be a general kind of fear that AI is going to replace you. Um, I know that, you know, we've experienced this a lot. We do a lot of work with Edify with, with like creative agencies, uh, with development teams, but this idea that you're going to be completely replaced by AI. Um, now, whilst there's a lot of hype around AI at the moment, I think it's really important to point out that your job won't necessarily be taken by AI, but the chances are that someone who can use AI will probably take your job. So just by attending this session today, uh, over the next 45 minutes, hopefully we'll give you some nuggets of information that you can take back into your team uh, and really start asking the difficult questions about AI strategy uh, and where AI fits into your sort of overall product vision. I also just wanted to share this with you quickly. Um, in terms, we call this the product disruption continuum. Um, and certainly we work with a lot of product teams at the moment um, who might be sort of in the stages where they're feeling like AI is kind of not really having a major impact on the on the product or the services that they're offering. Um, you might be starting to integrate some very basic kind of APIs. Maybe you'll speed up some of the production process. Maybe you're using AI in terms of some of the uh, sort of product management disciplines, you know, whether that's conducting research, you know, building MVPs, um, you know, wireframing, et cetera. Um, but inevitably, for most organizations who have some kind of technical product offering, we can almost certainly guarantee over the next few years that you're going to start moving towards the right of this scale, um, where your products will start naturally becoming AI uh, integrated and AI driven, um, with a very real chance that uh, AI may end up rendering your product completely obsolete. So it's a really crucial time for businesses um, to be really thinking about their product strategy and where AI fits into that. Um, AI... Like I said, there's been a lot of hype around it uh, at the moment, specifically around generative AI. Um, we need to kind of start to see beyond that hype. Uh, and again, really thinking about the, the future of our business. I also think it's crucial for organizations to appreciate that when it comes to sort of overall AI strategy within the organization, it kind of have to, has to start with product um, and start with the way that you're serving your customers uh, and really thinking about how you can integrate um, AI solutions to not only become more efficient uh, in the way that you service your customers or you build and you launch new product features, um, but also how you can continue to value add. Uh, and later on in the session today, we'll give you some really useful tools and resources to help frame and to think about that. 
I also just wanted to quickly land this, this concept with you. This is something that BCG published uh, about a year ago. I'm um, talking about why generative AI is so disruptive and kind of grouping it into five major categories. And I wanted to share this because I think they're all kind of relevant to product teams. Um, there are going to be certain functions within a product team where AI can completely automate uh, existing processes. That means it can assess the necessary context, it can reach a conclusion, it can take action for you. There are, however, other functions within product teams where it's more of an augmentation uh, kind of effect. So where AI might not necessarily have the context, um, but it can kind of make some decisions for you, but you still need to have some human touch there, where AI can recommend different things, um, where AI can sort of become your creative partner, uh, helping you brainstorm or come up with new ideas, um, but also crucially, maybe where AI has absolutely no context at all, uh, the stakes are too high, and perhaps you shouldn't actually necessarily be integrating it just now with its current limitations, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be considering where it could be in 12 months from now. And if you think about it, uh, OpenAI only re released GPT-4 just over a year ago. Um, so if you look at the amount of disruption that's happened in the past sort of 14, 15 months, it's been kind of phenomenal, kind of staggering. Uh, so again, hopefully today we're equipping you with some of the ideas and some of the thoughts to start thinking a little bit further ahead uh, and really considering AI as part of your product strategy. So on that note, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the formidable Eva, um, who's joining us today from Hatch Labs. Eva, I'm going to let you introduce yourself uh, and uh, share with us a little bit um, of your experience. I also just want to shout out to everyone who's here. It is a very busy session today, um, but we do have the Q&A function live. Uh, we'd love to hear your questions for Eva and myself. Um, obviously, between us, we have extensive experience in the world of product. Uh, so keep those questions coming through. We're going to pause at natural points throughout the throughout the presentation to pick those questions up, but feel free to drop them in using the Q&A function at any point. Eva, on that note, I'm handing over to you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so excited to present with you today and welcome everyone. So I'm Eva. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Hatch Labs, where we help deep tech founders and organizations to grow their startups, leveraging AI and ML. Prior to that, I've been an AI professor at the University of Florida, launching uh, a diverse research portfolio across industries. And also, um, I've been an AI product leader for the past almost 10 years um, in different industries, mostly B2B, but also in ad tech, um, leveraging um, a lot of growth and also a lot of uh, deep tech products. Um, and one of them was out of my PhD research. Um, and finally, all these experiences um, culminated um, almost 10 years ago when I finished my PhD from MIT and University of Cambridge in computer vision. Because AI is, is, is kind of the buzzword these days, like everybody's using it, but it I actually came like decades ago. So I'm glad to be on that <laughs> hype. So with that, uh, let's get started uh, with, first of all, um, how is AI product strategy different? Because I'm, I'm sure a lot of you um, have been working uh, in product uh, and you are familiar about the traditional product strategy stack where you would be looking into your company's mission, your company's strategy. How is this strategically differentiated? Uh, your product roadmap and your goals. So you have been asking those questions like, is this the right problem to solve based on your company's mission? Is this the right solution? Um, does it provide like quantitative mode compared to existing benchmarks or alternative alternative products? Why you, your company, and your product will stand out? Or what's the sequence of steps that deliver the proposed outcomes? Uh, in the, however, uh, the AI product strategy stack uh, is a quite different, and we will uh, cover today the framework that you see on the right where there are four main pillars that we need to make sure we um, uh, understand. First of all, the technical feasibility, like how are we going to deliver that product um, and whether that's gonna be viable because there is a lot of it, remember, is, a, is research um, at this stage. So we need to make sure that this product can be delivered seamlessly with always our North Star, our customers in production. 
so this is key as opposed to other traditional ML or AI products that have been in the market already. In terms of value, like why is this? Uh, why should we use AI in the first place? What's the value you add in your product tech stack? Um, adoption, like how you're, how and what are you um, going to do? And finally, risks. What are the risks that you need to be aware of? Because there's this is a multidimensional problem. So with that in mind, uh, we will discuss uh, the um, uh, each of these elements. And I'll show you frameworks as well as applications so that um, we can uh, understand each of these four in today's session. So we will start with uh, technical feasibility, which is a key pillar and differentiator, as we mentioned, uh, for um, these new um, AI-powered generative uh, pro AI products. So first of all, um, the technical feasibility aspect answers the question of how. Uh, this is a multidimensional question, uh, and to answer that, um, you can leverage resources such as the generative AI flywheel, which we don't have time to cover today, but it's part of program offerings that Nick will share towards the end of the session. Uh, and this framework will help you to gather requirements and also define the product roadmap based on data, AI models, and user feedback. In, but to start, um, this is a very simple framework where <clears throat> you can answer three main questions. <clears throat> first of all, um, the first question is, can you improve the product uh, significantly? So <clears throat> you need to determine if you can offer uh, a better product. Um, or is the idea fundamentally sound, technically viable, and scalable? So you will evaluate the core value of your idea. Is this uh, a scalable solution? Uh, is it a sound constant? And finally, do you have the right team to execute it? So you need to consider a lot of, of your team's unique qualifications, whether they align with your, your ideas, strengths, and making sure that if you don't have those, uh, can you uh, determine a hiring plan for, for an AI team to deliver and execute? Uh, on, those, on those goals. Also, a very important consideration, uh, which is part of this framework, uh, is um, that many times AI power products are not scalable. Uh, so we need to be able to understand uh, the scalability aspects um, because there are a lot of concerns at the pre-launch stage, which we need to um, make sure we understand before uh, we launch so that there is a successful um, uh, launch for these products. So first of all, um, to answer the question of can you improve the product significantly, uh, we need to look into this uh, with three main drivers in mind. Uh, first, um, uh, in terms of is there an AI technology mode, and I'll show you an example with um, Uber uh, and about that. How urgent is the need based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Uh, because a lot of times um, uh, AI is, is uh, thought to be um, uh, the hammer uh, looking for a nail, which should not be the case, as we always need to think about, uh, uh, about the importance and the value add that um, uh, this technology is um, adding to the user's um, needs. And finally, what are the metric indicators that uh, are, uh, are going to be your North Star metrics, basically? Uh, and they are going to give you the buy-in, but also the significance that uh, this product is viable and you can go to market with that. So let's look into um, an example with Uber, and in particular, um, their technology mode uh, lies in the advanced optimization algorithms, for instance, that they use for operations, for uh, efficient real-time matching between drivers and riders, uh, for dynamic pricing models uh, that respond to uh, the changes in supply and demand, but also for route optimization for, to, for you to have like quicker, most uh, cost-effective journeys. So these AI-driven systems are self-improving with each ride. Uh, so a lot of data gathering there. So it's a data network effect that can serve as a competitive 
ba uh, um, barrier for Uber, and it makes it very challenging for new entrants in this market to compete. Um, however, of course, there needs to be ongoing innovation and continuous improvements in these algorithms uh, to make sure that uh, Uber maintains its mode. Uh, but this is an example where you can see that clearly in this vertical, Uber has taken the lead uh, on that. Uh, now let's see for the next question uh, regarding the urgency of the needs, like why would um, be, would it be so urgent uh, for um, for someone to um, use uh, um, Uber? Three aspects, uh, physiological needs, and these are crucial both um, for uh, both drivers uh, because they rely on, on, the, on the income from driving to meet their basic needs, but also for riders as well, the physiological aspect that they need transportation to access food, to access work, to, to access any other services that are essential for their daily lives. Uh, so you see how important it becomes like from a, from a need, from a user's standpoint. Um, and also safety needs. Um, this is such a significant concern in this industry, both from the drivers, but also the rider side, because drivers need to feel safe. Um, uh, to continue working with Uber, but also riders, they need to have that safe transportation from one location to the other uh, without feeling threatened. And finally, esteem needs, uh, where um, it's in the form of recognition, respect uh, for the drivers uh, and for riders, uh, that they need to um, continue um, uh, using Uber uh, uh, in terms of convenience, uh, other compared to other uh, forms of transportation. So in general, you see that as a company, they embraced these needs and these are the core of the service. Um, and um, esteem needs might be less urgent, but still important as they contribute to the customer and driver satisfaction for this program, uh, but also loyalty. So you see where we are in the technical feasibility aspect yet, uh, however, uh, the uh, customer's needs are central to the product success. Uh, so th this is the, uh, the first the aspect of how you can improve the product significantly. And having that in mind, let's see some metric indicators, which um, suggest that, this, that Uber's product is working properly. For, um, and um, this can be shown with specific um, um, uh, KPIs and ROI. So three aspects to look for here, uh, user growth, ride growth and frequency, and finally revenue and profitability. So you can see the numbers uh, here speak from them themselves. Um, if, if you show that, uh, yeah, inter especially with, with like even in early stage, uh, products, then um, it's uh, it's an offering that, of course, it will be like a, fi a financially viable solution. It is utilized frequently. You can see like the um, there is no significant user retention, uh, and it's a very comprehensive view of how uh, Uber's products like operate. Uh, so this is uh, an example that uh, we can see from a very well established product, which is based on. Um, on AI uh, algorithms and not uh, and and you can use that as an example of uh, as a launchpad for how to create and grow these types of products. Um, the second aspect uh, is uh, related to um, uh, technical viability and scalability. This is really important uh, because as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of uh, research that is still ongoing uh, with these products. Like we have every time a new version of GPT-4, of uh, Claude, um, Gemini that is released and there needs to be some testing um, in a lot of aspects and a lot of, um, especially verticals, there is not um, uh, one solution fits it all. There will need to be significant modifications and, and uh, um, technical understanding of how this solution works so that it caters the customer's needs. And some questions to ask uh, are, first of all, um, is there a path when you can actually uh, have a um, significant 
ARR uh, within the next uh, years, within the next five years, why you should launch this product now. Like you should have a very compelling business case and product case of why this is important to be launched right now. And finally, uh, compliance. Uh, and we will see with a separate section about risks, but overall, like, is uh, are there any regulatory concerns that you need to be aware of? Um, and just thinking through um, every aspect that could potentially um, be a threat for the launch of this product. Uh, so with, uh, with that in mind, the last part uh, that um, you need to ask uh, your teams and as you're executing on these is do you have a team that possesses the right skills and qualifications to bring these products to life? Um, and are they uniquely positioned to solve this, pro this problem? Uh, or do you need to hire um, uh, a, a new team to do that? Of course, there will be a lot of significant planning before doing that. That's why I have positioned it in the, towards the end. Um, and also, if, for example, um, you uh, proceed and you develop this uh, in the market, is there a possibility that there will be another product and let's say in the next six months, um, there is significant threat that um, uh, your product team, your product will be replaced by that new uh, offering. So again, that will go and be linked directly with having a specific, um, compelling uh, technology uh, and business mode. Uh, and um, this is why uh, the technical feasibility aspect is so important and significant uh, to be addressed um, uh, towards the beginning of this exploration and planning. So at, at this stage, um, uh, we can take a few uh, questions uh, if there are from the group. We haven't had any come through yet, Eva, but um, maybe if we, okay. yeah, briefly summarize the session. Again, if there's any questions around technical feasibility, feel free to submit them in through the Q&A. Um, but if not, we'll move into talking to this, talking about maybe the second piece of the framework, which of course is around kind of value. Um, and then we'll do a proper pause for, for questions there. So please, please keep them coming in. I can see it's a very, very busy session. So there must be some questions uh, out there in the audience um, around some of this uh, stuff that Eva is covering. But yeah, let's kick into value. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So now in terms of value, um, and we can go to the next slide. Um, there, there is a um, first of all a, a very important framework that can help you to articulate that value that your product brings in, because from the technical feasibility aspect, we saw a lot of um, a lot of attention across: is this the right product, the right team? Is it, is this product scalable? A lot of aspects and a lot of technical. Uh, elements there. Uh, however, here we really want to focus on uh, is this actually a product that users will buy? And what's the value? Why, no, uh, why now? You have already asked that question before from a technical standpoint, but now it needs to be coupled with what your customers really want and, and whether they're willing to, to buy that product. So a simple way, which I'm sure uh, a lot of you will have used this uh, before, um, is this powerful tool called the jobs to be done framework where uh, we need to uh, be able to understand the needs and motivations of our users. Uh, so it focuses on the core tasks that your customers are trying to accomplish. And essentially you need to answer, this, answer the question, what's the job that your product is being hired to do? So consider the example that people who need to drill a hole often do not want to drill. They just want the hole to be in the wall. Another example is a user uh, might hire a video streaming company like uh, an app like Netflix um, to not just watch shows, but to entertain themselves and unwind after a long day. Uh, so these are just some testaments that through innovation blossoms when we understand the core problems or the job that our customers aim to solve. So in the era of generative AI, these insights are especially crucial because the technology is emerging and the user expectations are still being formulated. So better, uh, especially uh, better than before, you need to be able to articulate that value 
for your users while you have like these uh, new uh, needs that are coming up, this new emerging technology um, that can actually solve uh, those needs. So um, an opportunity statement like the one that we see on the screen uh, is a tool that can express that value that these products can deliver. Uh, so it helps in keeping the product development focused and customer driven. Uh, and when building AI powered products, an opportunity statement can help you to highlight how AI can generate value for your customers. Uh, so here's how you can craft that opportunity statement for generative AI products. So first of all, looking at your audience and what's the specific uh, uh, situation, the circumstance. So what's your target audience along with the specifics of, your, of the situation that can create the need for your product? Uh, then you need to think about that priority job to be done. So the core job that your customer needs to get done, and that would be either a functional job, it could be an emotional job, or a social job. And finally, what's your success grade area? So outlining what the user considers to be a successful outcome. So with that in mind, we will see an example from uh, a product, uh, a generative AI product, to show you exactly how you can use this framework. So we see here uh, the customer. Uh, so Anna, uh, is uh, uh, an employee at a consulting company. She is frustrated because she wants to find uh, a lot of data resources. She has lots of um, documents, lots of um, client uh, uh, data uh, for her project. And she ends up spending thousands and hundreds of hours searching on the web, searching in, the, in her company's use case portfolio to identify those data sources and making sure that she can create a compelling use case for her client project. Uh, now, uh, the actual job for, for Anna is that she wants to have a tool that can help amplify her search abilities. Like Anna will still continue to search, but she wants to amplify that search and being able to um, also get some feedback on whether all everything that she has been um, searching for is valid uh, and also improve the quality uh, of her search. So let's see uh, the actual uh, value. Uh, that Perplexity, which is an AI-based uh, product, offers to Anna. Uh, so first of all, it caters her need that it can be seamlessly integrated into her consulting process, into some tools that she's using uh, in her day-to-day -day job. And also it offers significant time reduction without sacrificing quality uh, of searching across a diverse set of, of resources and documents. So this is how this product serves its purpose. And with this simple framework, you can, you can see like easily who was the customer, uh, what was the actual job, and finally, what was the value from the, for, for this product. So the product uh, value, in other words, answers the question of why and, and why we need to leverage AI to build that product. So you can see here it's very clear why because we had an employee that was spending hundreds of hours searching through documents, and there's a clear need that this process can be automated, uh, and where this product sits in the AI value chain. So is this a new vertical application? Is this a new infrastructure application, a new a foundational model provider, uh, a helpful resource to position the product uh, is the AI value chain, uh, which we don't have time to cover and delve into detail today, but this is also part of the AI programs that we are offering. Uh, and uh, after my presentation, Nick will show you uh, about those uh, towards the end. So it's important to address the strategic differentiation as part of your value. And that would be your deep domain expertise in an industry vertical, uh, your unique customer base, defensible IP. Uh, this will help you, for instance, to tackle hallucinations, um, exclusive data resources, and I will show you some strategies about that. Uh, it could be proprietary data sets uh, that you are developing or even distribution channels, uh, because um, overall, uh, we have uh, lots of the distribution challenges that are available, and this is also something that you can develop and think through about uh, when you're thinking about your strategy. 
so with that, uh, we can move on to the next part, uh, which is risks and how uh, you can identify these risks uh, which are associated with your generative AI strategy. Uh, so two important aspects that we will uh, deep dive today are there is some risk mitigation strategies, uh, which I will show you in the next slides. Uh, and it's important to start small with those and iterate multiple times uh, until you have defined that uh, defensible strategy. And finally, uh, we will close with uh, the generative AI trust framework. So let's look into risks and particularly risks associated with your data, which is, and I saw in the beginning uh, of your um, of this session uh, that uh, we looked uh, uh, some of you mentioned data is one of the um, main challenges that you face when implementing these, um, these tools and technologies. Uh, so these are some ways that you can uh, start uh, thinking through with your teams. First of all, how to create, how to collect and label in-house data. Or if you are looking for uh, a solution that, that is more scalable, are there providers that you can leverage um, and that can help streamline this journey? Uh, secondly, uh, this is where like, if you want to hire an army, um, uh, you can crowdsource that. Of course, it depends on how um, delicate and how um, sophisticated your data sets are. Um, then uh, a lot of times I'm seeing uh, use cases where publicly available data sets are not actually leveraged. And this is a great way if you can actually search for those publicly available sources that can be commercialized and you can mine data through those. Also thinking through licensing potentially third-party data that can help you like either build your use case either through an API or you can implement it uh, with your with SDKs in a third party mobile app um, and always of course with uh, having the user's consent uh, on that to capture the data and finally a uh, human or user in the loop uh, where you can actually incentivize users to give you feedback because as we said this is super important especially for these products to be able right from the start right right from the launch of your products to be able to uh, capture that feedback uh, efficiently so now um, let's see um, how you can actually mitigate some risks with three um, strategies, which are very simple, uh, but you can start like leveraging those uh, when you're thinking about uh, launching these products. First of all, uh, don't assume that your customers will know how uh, AI-driven products work. Uh, there's a lot of information. Uh, there's a ton of misunderstanding um, as in terms of how this technology works, what the expectations are. Uh, so you need to be patient with them and help them understand what's the reality instead of like a myth or, or a context that they're thinking and it's beyond expectations. So making sure that you're not overpromising, you're not rushing to execution, it's really important. Here, as we said, customers are at the center uh, of, uh, of your development. So really uh, helping your customers and setting the context right from uh, the beginning. Uh, secondly, um, how you can foster that experimental culture in your teams, because it's not um, it's not a traditional product launch like it has been for other technologies. Right now, if you were to launch like an NLP based product, there are so many guidelines or a computer vision product. There, there's, uh, there are tools uh, out of the box that you can use and there's not a lot of experimentation that's needed. It's basically technology that has matured. There, there are lots of playbooks. You, you can do that easily. But with uh, GenAI products, there needs to be a culture of trial and error. Um, even like building a demo might seem easy and, and like you have an expectation for a client in like a week or two, yes, I can build that demo easily, but you know, think through these four pillars. These four pillars that we're going through today before committing to um, building and executing on anything. It's really important to have that strategy right to avoid being in situations in the future where it will be like, 
at end end in terms of this product is not feasible, it's not scalable, and so on and so forth. So really um, uh, fostering that experimental culture until these products become more mature in the pipelines and the, the tools are actually leveraging uh, the their purpose. And lastly, uh, which we already talked about in terms of expectations, like making sure that uh, you listen to your customers' concerns, what they really want, are their expectations realistic uh, and aligned with what your teams can deliver and uh, what's the capability uh, out there um, and making sure that uh, you decide accurately based on that. So with that, um, I also want to give you um, an overview of how to think about uh, the Generative AI Trust Framework, because this is super important, especially for these products. We will just briefly walk through uh, this, uh, because this is a longer conversation, of course, and we don't have the time today to deep dive. Uh, but as I mentioned, there are so many programs that we're offering. And if you're interested, um, uh, Nick will share uh, details later. later. So first of all, this landscape is very complex. There are so many stakeholders that are contributing daily to what we're seeing. Um, and uh, in that space of trust and, um, and trustworthiness and safety, uh, there are lots of um, policy guidelines that are continuously being developed, including like the executive order uh, that we had uh, in the States or the AI safety summit that happened um, a couple of months ago. Uh, and all of those will formulate some new standards uh, for AI safety, for security, for privacy. So you need to think about privacy concerns, making sure that you are aligned uh, with your customers on that. Security, as an example of that, um, you need to make sure you have robustness to adversarial attacks. What does it mean? Like, for example, there are jailbreak prompts, or um, what, is, uh, what does a jailbreak prompt mean? Uh, it's actually a prompt that is designed to intentionally confuse those LLMs into producing content that's norm that normally wouldn't be harmful or, or illegal. But um, it's really like... Uh, jailbreaking those uh, LLMs, or it's it's like jailbreaking a device, basically, uh, as we knew this term in the past, uh, to allow this unauthorized access and behavior. And this happens. So you, you need to make sure that you have set some guardrails so that this does not occur for, um, uh, for a, a scalable product that, that you've built. Um, and safety. Of course, we need to ensure that the um, these products are based on large language models, operate reliably, they're not causing harm to anyone, uh, and uh, reducing bias. And we saw some data mitigation strategies earlier uh, today as well about that. Lastly, uh, we have uh, uh, three more aspects to think through when it comes to really formulating that generative AI trust framework. Fairness, uh, when you mitigate biases when it comes to gender, race, age, um, uh, inclusion uh, is also an aspect of that. And finally, accountability and interpretability. So what will be your, uh, how are you going to trace the decisions back to data sets, back to um, specific training methods that you use? Are you going to use fine tuning versus um, other like RAG approaches? Uh, and uh, who is going to be accountable into that? Or if you're using like third-party providers, make, um, making sure that you know all the implications in your uh, product uh, stack. Uh, there are lots of frameworks here, uh, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is part uh, of uh, the of of this is part of an overview that I want to give you uh, and to uh, start uh, spark some conversation in your teams. With that, we now can move to the last part of the AI product strategy, uh, which is adoption. So we saw technical feasibility, we saw the value that you need to define clearly for your products risks, and finally adoption. So with adoption, uh, we answer the question of what is the most valuable use case that will have the quickest time to value. Uh, and some adoption criteria are, 
internally, like what are your skills, your leadership, uh, cultural shifts that need to happen for this product to be adopted. External, like we saw regulatory concerns, ethical AI governance aspects, and finally technical um, in terms of novelty, innovation for this product. So I'm giving you a framework to get, to get started, uh, which is the machine learning canvas. Uh, and it really um, uh, is like your business canvas, but from a machine learning AI perspective. So you can start with like your task, um, what's the impact, the decisions that you need to make, how are you going to make predictions uh, that are going to be viable for this product. You see here again, value proposition is at the center collect data collection and where are you going to get your data? Super important. Uh, how are you going to build these models? What are the tools that you're going to uh, leverage? Uh, and finally, this is your features uh, and, and monitoring uh, the uh, development process uh, for your products. And then uh, lastly, uh, uh, how are we going to get started with all of this? So three key takeaways that I want to leave you with. First of all, um, and like we discussed earlier, you need to have some technology mode uh, and business mode. So one, of, on, one way you can think about that is, uh, do you have a proprietary uh, asset? And that could be data. What do you have that others don't? Um, is it access to your customer base? Uh, do you have a community that you can get feedback? There's, there are lots of tools that now companies leverage in terms of even open sourcing some tools and getting direct feedback for your products that can be super helpful to, to, help, to help launch a larger scale uh, commercial uh, enterprise product. So one is the proprietary asset that you have. Second, uh, set the expectations that this is an experiment. I mentioned that earlier as well. So you can build them that could be easy, but is this scalable? Is this a product that um, can have clear outcomes for your customers, um, it can uh, deliver the expectations and can stand out for the next uh, five years, 10 years? And finally, build your products um, and think practically at first. Uh, so making sure that you have the data, this is number one, uh, what models you need to select, which providers in terms of functionality, in terms of cost, uh, and making sure that you build with uh, continuously evaluating and risk uh, mitigation strategies, um, even if those are open source models and products, and always thinking through legal considerations and aspects there. So uh, uh, do we have any questions? We do. We've had a couple of good questions come through. And we'll pause for a second to pick up any more uh, that anyone has. Obviously, we've covered a lot of ground, a lot of frameworks um, in, in this session. For anyone that is uh, watching, and there was a lot to take in, if you are interested in, in finding out more about these frameworks or the programs that we run, you can complete this form here and the, the team will be in touch. The first question we got in was just particularly, our product team is not even talking about AI in the tech sex tech stack yet? Where is the place best place for us to start? Maybe I can pick that one up, Eva. I mean, being at this webinar is a good place to start. Um, kind of just, just knowledge sharing. I think you mentioned earlier on kind of just building the skills in. Training is probably one of the uh, one of the best places. So having the necessary conversations, getting people into workshops or webinars and learning about the potentials and the pitfalls of generative AI. Uh, and starting to really consider um, and have those necessary conversations is probably one of the best places to to start. We actually have a great program for that, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. If if you really are at the early stages and not at the, maybe some of the more advanced stages that that Eva's gone through. The second question maybe is one for you, Eva. So, is there an industry standard for trust and safety with LLMs in the same way there is for penetration testing or static code scanning? So, is trust and safety certification something that we should be outsourcing to a third party firm? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there are um, uh, some frameworks, uh, actually a lot of them. It depends on, on the use case and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, one that I saw uh, recently uh, was from uh, uh, the 
government in, in Singapore where there were uh, two practical aspects that they were looking at, like the severity of harm that AI can cause in an application and the probability that this harm can happen in your application. Uh, and I, uh, we can send over some resources on, on that framework. Uh, so in general, the, the, there were three possible uh, recommendations. Like, first of all, whether the human should be in the loop, supervising closely the AI's operation, um, whether the human should be over the loop, like managing escalations, any high-level operations of the AI, or finally, whether there is no human required and the AI can operate autonomously. Uh, but there are... Uh, uh, like as I mentioned, this is a simple way to think through it, uh, and I'm happy to share more resources um, if if uh, if needed. Brilliant. And we've got another question here. Um, another great question, actually. Are there any best practices for calculating unit economics? For example, how can sales pricing be set based on compute cost, etc.? I know this has been very topical for the for the big AI companies, Gen AI companies, in the in the kind of the the past twelve months with tokens. But what are your thoughts uh, around that, Eva? Yeah, that's another uh, great question. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, uh, it depends on whether we have like an API offering uh, or uh, whether we are thinking about developing this solution um, in house with like training, the models are served. So, so overall, like whether the first layer of the of answering this question is. Um, uh, whether we have an open source versus proprietary model development. Uh, if it's um, open sourced, uh, where the team will be responsible for like all the training um, and uh, development of the models, then we need to think through um, uh, a lot of aspects like how how training would cost how much training would cost itself um how how we can batch the data in a way so that uh we can have like for inference like a, a unit price that covers both training and inference aspects and and we can get to profitability there uh so that part will be a little more complex than the actual proprietary part where we have like uh, Nick mentioned, like tokens and APIs that or have some standardized pricings um, uh, attached to them. So in those cases, um, we uh, we just go by like again, like training and inference um, unit prices uh, based on the provider's uh, recommendations and making sure that these are aligned with the expectations that we have for, for this uh, product that we're building. Uh, so this is the, the first layer that I would look for that. Uh, and if we need to use like other uh, systems, like let's say RAG, again, uh, making sure that um, with the amount of data, like I, th I think it's a, a uh, it's always a matter of like um, latency, data, and cost. Like these three parameters that we need to to think through when we're formulating that pricing uh, framework. Brilliant, thank you, Eva. We don't have any more questions in at the moment, but uh, we will stick around towards the end of the session if there is any others that come up, but very conscious of everyone's time that's been in here. And thank you everyone for joining us and particularly thank you Eva for taking us through that. Very much a whistle stop tour, lots of ideas and thoughts in there um, about sort of AI and product strategy. I just wanna talk for a moment just about some of the programs that we run. So if you are attending this webinar today and you're like, you know, there's some food for thought in here, but I think we really need to push this to the next level. Um, we here at Edify Academy, we have a whole host of different training programs around AI. Um, but what really differentiates us um, from maybe other AI training providers out there is the fact as much as we look at kind of the tech stack and the data piece, um, a lot of what we've gone through today and policies and procedures, we're also very focused on people and culture um, because we find that they're real drivers for, for a long lasting transformative change within organizations. Uh, and we have a bunch of different programs, but three which are really particularly relevant to product teams, um, our AI for Leaders Bootcamp, uh, which is really geared at, geared at like a sort of C-suite to get them thinking with more of a product mindset uh, about what they need to do and how they might need to pivot the organization. We have our AI-powered design sprint, 
uh, which is like a two and a half day program designed for more generalist product teams, needing a bit of a kickstart into AI um, and thinking about the double diamond design process and how to really um, bring AI into that for conducting market research and understanding customer needs and building MVPs, et cetera. Two and a half days, quite kind of intensive. We have also just launched a six week, very intensive AI for product managers program, uh, which really goes deep uh, into many of the topics that Eva has discussed today, but also many more um, really for design for teams that are trying to pivot to an AI product or maybe trying to integrate AI into an existing product uh, that really need uh, quite intensive learning and coaching uh, in terms of how to do that. So if you are interested in any of those programs or you want to share uh, you want us to share with you any of the resources that we've we've discussed today, you can scan the QR code on the screen there um, or drop us a note. Uh, you can email us, email me directly, nick at edify.co.uk um, or click the link that I've just shared as well. So yeah, lots of programs there. Um, again, from sort of much more strategic thinking at the top of the pyramid right down into much more kind of implementational um, use cases for AI into product. But I think that more or less brings us to the end of the session. I'm not sure ever if, either if there's anything else you wish to share or any kind of parting words of wisdom for our audience. Um, my last like words would be in terms of um, making sure that when you're building uh, and design building and designing these products, you don't rush to execution. Uh, you really think and plan um, ahead. Uh, with we, we shared a lot today and there's a lot more that comes into the planning phase but I'm from what I've seen uh, in the industry in different applications use cases across verticals it's very easy with the um, with the accessibility of resources that we have right now to just rush and develop something quickly but as I said it's very easy to develop MVPs and and demos but go take a step back and think through like how is this product going to add value to your users and uh, how you can scale it um, and making sure you have a planning track before you commit and you invest uh, millions of dollars into this that, that would be my my closing thought brilliant thank you so much Eva. and i think that is really wise words of wisdom you know particularly with an mvp culture we are taught to do things really fast. Um, and there's a quote I think from Peter Drucker I love that says that there's nothing worse than doing with great efficiency, something that should not be done in the first place. So on that note, thank you everyone for attending today. Hopefully a useful session. Definitely reach out if you'd like to find out more about our programs or you want us to share some of these frameworks and resources with you. Uh, and hopefully see you in one of our future webinars. Thank you, Eva. And uh, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much.